Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Richard Ladner, uh, Principal Investigator for Access cs for all along with Professor Stefik from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And uh, today we're really pleased to introduce uh, Sarah Cyrus from the Landmark School in Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about teaching students with language-based learning disabilities. I, I wanted to give her a hand to start with because she's she's the CSTA. She is a CSTA Equity Fellow this year, which was quite an honor for her. Um, also, I want to mention just briefly that we will have another uh, event on June 16th, which is a teacher to teacher computer science education for neuro neurodiverse students. So that you might also be interested in, in that one. So Sarah, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, as was just said, we're gonna be talking about reaching students with language-based learning disabilities within a computer science classroom. So as Richard just introduced, my name is Sarah and I teach at the Landmark School in Beverly. It is a school entirely for students with language-based learning disabilities. I have been teaching there for 11 years now. Um, and in those 11 years, I have been teaching computer science for seven. We have a school of about 310 students at the high school level. Um, with a three to one student to teacher ratio. So we have a very small class size because it is a fully special ed setting. Um, our classes max out typically at eight. I've had up to nine in my classes before. Um, we serve grades eight through 12, both residential and day. Um, and we have about a 35, 65 female to male ratio at our school. Um, our school also is has publicly funded students. So about 60%, I want to say, of our students receive some funding from their public school to attend Landmark. So we do meet all um, federal and statewide criteria for special education as well. So, um, I think it's important to kind of put this into the bigger context of special education. We have about 2,342,000 students with a specific learning disability under IDEA as of 2017, 2018, which is the most data that, uh, the most recent data that I could find. So if you are teaching a course that is honors or AP, the odds are you still have students in your courses who have a learning disability, um, even though you may not officially know that. Um, maybe they have an IEP or maybe they do not, maybe you're in a private setting or a charter, um, but the odds are there is a student in your classroom who has a learning disability. So with that many students having a learning disability, uh, with 2,342,000 students having a specific learning disability, that's about 4.6% of all students. I can only assume this number has grown in time. So I think it's important to approach this from the standpoint of anybody can learn computer science. Um, there will obviously be an umbrella within that, but I think that all of our students, given the appropriate accommodations, can make this happen. So my students here, this is my dodgeball team, the Nerd Herd. We did come in second that year. It was a miracle. Um, in the year that this picture was taken, I had 18 students split between three classes. Um, with a gender ratio that was on par for the school. Um, and we made it through the year with amazing projects that came out of it. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them later as we go through. So specific learning disability is a widely varied umbrella. 
Um, LBLD officially falls under that umbrella, language based learning disabilities. So what is a specific learning disability? It can include difficulties with oral or written expression, decoding, fluency or comprehension, auditory processing, working memory, dysgraphia or dyscalculia, and executive functioning. Students with a specific learning disability could have an issue with just one of these pieces, or they could struggle with several of them. And every student will present in a different way. Um, however, another important thing to think about too in labeling is that just as someone who is gender non-conforming can choose how they identify, a student can choose to use disability or difference in how they describe their difficulties with reading or with language. So, okay. So I'm gonna talk about reading first. So I think when you hear the word dyslexia, this is what people first think of. Um, and students can struggle with all of these pieces or they can struggle with just one or two. Um, I've had students who could read very fluently, who could sit down, read a whole page of an advanced text, and then still struggle to tell me what they just read at all. They would have a hard time recalling their main ideas, their details, being able to connect information to the text. Um, decoding can also be a difficulty. Decoding is one's ability to break down a word that is unknown. So being able to break it into syllables and then read it following normal convention. Um, oftentimes comprehension can be lost when students are struggling with the decoding piece because they're working so hard on breaking the words down that they can't retain what they're reading. So there are many different ways that comprehension plays into that. So working memory, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well, um, can play into this because when you are having trouble holding something in your short-term memory, comprehension can then also suffer. Academic vocabulary is another piece that our students can find difficult to hold on to and remember um, when they've spent more time in their academic careers, getting up to a specific reading level, academic vocabulary can suffer just as it does for students who are English language learners. Um, so especially in our field in computer science, where the vocabulary can be really domain specific, right? I don't think I heard the word concatenate for the first time until I was, I don't know, maybe 25. Um, and so our students are, are going to be encountering a lot of these words for the first time as well, or at least in this context, right? The word variable means something slightly different um, in this context than what they may have seen in math class. So fluency is the last piece that I'll talk about here. And that's the ability to read something at an appropriate speed while maintaining accuracy and reading with expression. So those pieces all together form fluency. And students might be able to read quickly but have a lot of errors, in which case, again, comprehension will suffer. Or students might be able to read accurately, but speed might be a problem, which then is that putting a lot of uh, their energy, their mental energy into still remembering what they read when it's taken a while to get through it. Okay, expressive difficulties. So the two main pieces here are oral expression and written expression. Oral expression can manifest as a difficulty pulling up the words you want or need to express your thoughts. I'm sure we've all had that moment where we're sitting and thinking like, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, right? It happens to the best of us. Um, but for some students, this can be a real barrier to getting their ideas across. Um, this is where wait time can come in and be really helpful. I know five seconds doesn't sound 
like a lot of time, but when you're sitting in a large classroom setting and waiting those five seconds for a student to share their ideas, it can seem like quite a while. Um, but just being able to think about that as you are talking with students and giving them the chance, setting them up for success in that way. Um, you'll also see oral expressive difficulties come into play when you're brainstorming as a class, when students are working in groups, and in just day-to-day -day conversation, regardless of the topic. Written expression is where students have trouble with writing. This can manifest uh, in poor written grammar, um, while orally they may be able to get their thoughts across perfectly. Um, it can also be evident in oral rehearsal. So I'll have students who will sit down and tell me exactly what they're going to write or what they're going to say, and then really struggle to get it onto the page. So this can be a barrier when kids are starting to code in a text-based language and they have to suddenly be able to recall and be able to put into their development environment what they want to get across. Executive functioning. This is one that I think you can see in a huge amount of students across the spectrum. Um, it is the organization of time, information, and materials. We see it often in kids with learning disabilities, but again, I think it's highly prevalent even in those without. The ways that someone organizes these items is so key to success. Students can learn these skills, but oftentimes they need to be explicitly taught. This is a huge part of how we, we spend class time, um, often scaffolding for success in this regard. Um, students with executive functioning deficits are often the kid with like the exploding backpack, right? If you've ever in your classroom had a kid unzip his backpack to get out his laptop and like 12 different items fly out and there's a folder with a million things in it. Um, or the kid who highlights everything on a page when you're like, you know, why about you highlight what's important and they just do the whole thing. <laughs> I've seen that a lot. Um, or the kids who shut down at the idea of a long-term project, even if it's something they love, right? No matter what the task, just the idea of having to plan that all out can be really overwhelming. Um, I've seen students almost in tears over the prospect of having to tackle something like that. So they can really affect a student really severely. It can also present in our current digital world <laughs> where I'm sure Plenty of you are spending time on Zoom and on a computer with students. Um, in their computer being a mess, a student with a million tabs open and a student with a Google Drive with 50 items and they're all labeled untitled. I think that's my favorite right now. <laughs> Pull out your essay. Uh, thank goodness for the search function, right? So those are the different ways you might see it. It can also be when a student has trouble organizing information. Um, and because this is a way for them to gain independence until they have the necessary study skills, they're going to struggle with self-directed learning. So it's as simple as knowing how to search on Google, but it can also be as complex as having trouble taking effective notes in a lecture. Um, we wanna be able to set our students up for success by explicitly teaching them those skills. So a couple coexisting difficulties that I want to talk about include auditory processing disorder. Um, auditory processing disorder is where students have a hard time processing auditory stimuli, um, not necessarily in the way that students who are deaf or hard of hearing struggle with it, um, but more so in a way that they have a hard time figuring out what's important in their environment. It can present as if the student is not paying attention, especially when given oral directions, regardless of how simple the direction is. Um, I often see students who struggle with this at being a step behind their peers 
or unsure of where or what they should be doing. Um, this is where working in a multimodal classroom becomes so important. Um, so I will often be writing things on the board at the same time or typing things in the chat, just trying to present whatever I can in a few different ways. I had a student describe this to me as like currently I can hear a squirrel in a tree. I can hear a student in their backpack. I can hear two people walking in the hallway. I can hear the water bubbler in the hallway. And I can hear you talking and teaching me. But my brain like cannot tell me what I should pay attention to. So I'm splitting my attention. Working memory um, is your ability to hold information in your short-term memory. I think a, a key way to think of it is to think of like a phone number, right? Someone's trying to tell you their phone number and you're trying to remember <laughs> all the digits in, in the time it takes you to put it in your cell phone, right? Um, so this can be tough for a lot of people, but for some students, it can make a real difference in their level of performance in the classroom. So it can present when students are given oral information and then asked to act on it very quickly. Um, it can give a difficulty with multi-step directions and it can also slow down work progress because they might need to reference new material more often until it is banked in their more long-term memory. Um, I see this with students um, as an issue when we're learning new syntax a lot of the time. They'll have to keep referencing their notes and referencing their notes till it's more banked. Um, and so that adds time, the time it takes for them to move forward with that material more independently. Processing speed is the speed at which you can take an in information and then provide some output. A lot of times you'll see this in classroom, just in everyday conversation. Um, it's an instance where wait time is really important. Students may seem to be ignoring you or they may present as daydreaming um, when really they're just processing. And a lot of times um, they struggle to advocate that that's what's happening. In the moment, they're still trying to work through. So you might think they're not paying attention but really they're processing and they'll get there. So students can be affected by just one of these or none, or they can struggle with all three um, in addition to any reading or expressive difficulties they may have. They can exist for any classroom, any student in your classroom, not just those on IEPs. These are issues that you could see in any of your students. Um, so the next time you see a student like daydreaming out the window, you could give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Maybe they're processing. Maybe they're struggling to process the auditory stimuli in the room. So these are another couple bonus difficulties. Um, I call them a bonus because they tend to be secondary to the other kinds of learning disabilities that I've talked about so far. Dysgraphia is a difficulty with handwriting, um, though it doesn't come up as often for me as a computer science teacher, especially since everything is, is on um, the computer right now, right? <laughs> Even more so than usual. Um, it, still can be tough, especially when kids are brainstorming, they're working on a whiteboard. Um, I've had it described to me for, by a student as painting each letter individually. So every time he goes to write, it's essentially like he's painting the letter G, right? Has to think about the form and what it looks like. Um, so there are a lot of easy ways to help accommodate for that that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, dyscalculia is also a difficulty with numbers, numerical difficulty, um, as well as symbols. In computer science, this is clearly something that could really impact their work. Um, 
math and computer science are so closely tied. So if a student is struggling to identify the difference between two numbers like a four and a nine, which are very similar, especially when handwritten, um, or they confuse operators like the Majulo and a plus sign, right? Those two can also look very similar. Um, that can really, really mess up their program, um, which can then be really frustrating in turn, right? Their logic might be sound, but they might have swapped out Majula and Plus. So that could be a real bummer. So this has prompted me to focus closely on asking clarifying questions when students are expected to find a sum versus a product versus a quotient to ensure that they know what they're looking for. And it can cause a lot of difficulty in standardized situations where a simple math error can then cause everything found to be wrong. Um, so those are things to think about as well. So accommodating for specific learning disabilities. I want to talk a little bit about accommodation versus modification. An accommodation is when you provide some change in the way you deliver instruction. A modification is when the actual curriculum and standard being measured are changed to suit the student's needs and abilities. There are cases when one or the other or both are warranted. Oftentimes, if you are working within a mainstream classroom, um, you will be working on making accommodations for your students. Um, and that's important to think about how can I think about what is, what's really being tested here, right? What do I really wanna know? Do I wanna know if this student can spell the word variable? Or do I wanna know if this student can explain and use a variable, right? Things like that. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit about universal design for learning. Universal design for learning is the idea that making the curriculum accessible to all and not just those who have difficulties will benefit everybody. There are a lot of different ways this can be done. Um, and there are probably ways you're doing this right now without even thinking about it in this way, right? But when the barrier to entry is low, that benefits everyone. So something to think about. Um, I was once told by one of my professors um, in an assistive technology class I took that those who study assistive technology can see the future. Um, for instance, the computer, computer mouse um, that scrolled using a rolling ball um, back when we used computer mice frequently um, was actually created as, a, as an assistive technology device for those with limited mobility, which then became a popular device for everybody, not just those for whom it was designed. So by thinking about assistive technology and universal design in this way, we can open up a lot more of the field of computer science by making it more accessible to everybody. So the next few slides um, have a fair amount of text, so bear with me. But I think it's important because I want it to be able to be a resource to you. Okay. So when thinking about accommodating for struggling readers, it can be difficult when working in specific technical areas. Um, it doesn't help that there are very few textbooks or resources that are written for struggling readers within computer science. I have come to two different approaches within my classes. Um, as I'm the only computer science teacher at my private school and I created my own program, um, I might be a little luckier within this um, as I get to choose what I use. Um, but as a result, I don't really have a textbook. If I had to label a book as our class textbook, it would probably be some of the O'Reilly head first books on whatever language we're working on. Um, I have found those to be really useful for my students. They present information in a multimodal fashion with games, images, and text-based information, but it's not in a condescending way. Um, I'll share parts of the text with students um, that I think are applicable or helpful, but for the most part, 
I try to point them to web resources to find their answers independently. This can be a bit of a danger zone as they can also find materials that are too difficult and become discouraged. So I think an important piece is to be able to teach your students how to vet appropriate sources and how to use those sources. Um, some other important accommodations to remember include previewing terms and concepts with students orally prior to reading or independent practice as necessary. There are definitely times when I want them to figure something out on their own and as they gain more confidence and can handle more failure and struggle. But until that point, and sometimes even afterwards, it's important to allow them some familiarity with a topic before throwing them into the deep end, especially with text that might be too difficult for them to access. Um, when accommodating for fluency, the most important piece is allowing for extra time. This can involve giving students access to the reading ahead of time, allowing it to be a homework assignment or lessening or completely forgoing reading entirely. Another way this can be accommodated includes through audiobooks. Um, an important resource I found is um, something called Bookshare, which is a free service for students with documented learning disabilities that provides audiobooks. Um, it also is for students who are blind or visually impaired. So definitely check that out. That's bookshare.org. However, and this will probably come as no surprise to anybody, uh, my students hugely favor YouTube. Uh, we have a YouTube set of tutorials for everything. If they could use it for everything, they probably would, regardless of their reading ability. Um, you know, the bow ties in our dodgeball photos, we learned through a YouTube tutorial right before the match, right? YouTube has a wealth of content and it's fairly accessible um, and it's free, which is a bonus for any teacher. So this can also provide an opportunity for independence for all students and allow you to flip your classroom, um, which has been a godsend this year. So for example, uh, this can be really useful if your students might struggle with internet access um, at home. They can use do a flipped classroom or if they don't have their own device, you could get a YouTube downloader. If they have their own device, you could get a YouTube downloader for students. That could work as well. Um, there are so many great coding tutorials on YouTube that my students have really, really enjoyed. So definitely check that out as a way to accommodate. Accommodating for comprehension difficulties can definitely be more involved. And hopefully with preventative measures such as previewing, you can cut down on dedicated literal comprehension work. Um, and when I say literal, I mean fact-based, right? As opposed to abstract of drawing conclusions, making predictions. Um, you can ask questions throughout the lesson, both orally and written to help you assess the student's comprehension. I typically use a small slip of paper signaling I want a short, quick answer, right? I'll just cut paper up into small pieces or currently I'll use like a Google form with like the short answer section um, or even just say drop in the chat, right? Something quick like what does I plus plus mean, right? What does that mean? What's gonna happen? And then I can just real quick figure out, okay, you know, for the most part, we got it. So and so struggling. Um, and then I can go back and reassess as needed. Okay, struggle, uh, accommodations for students who struggle with oral expression. Um, if a student's struggling with oral expression, it can be evident fairly quickly. Um, the best way to accommodate this is to try and take some of the burden off processing by providing language they can use. This can be in the form of a sentence stem um, I like to project some on the board for everybody to see. It also gives everyone a better idea of what I'm looking for. It's also important to provide opportunities for rehearsal. I do this by having small groups and individual discussions with my students. Um, I also have students keep journals on Google Drive where they have to write um, about a given topic, their latest project or self-reflections. Um, this year, I even had them do Google Sites for themselves 
um, which they really enjoyed. And I think it was just really a fun project for them to have their own kind of portfolio and also their own log of what they're working on. Um, after that, we'll then segue into a class discussion where they have notes that are already pre-written and accessible to draw from as they continue on. I think it's really important not to force them to participate until they feel comfortable doing so. Oral expression skills are really important and they can be improved, but they also have to grow alongside confidence. Cueing can be also a very important strategy in the classroom. And I've been known to like mime and be ridiculous. If you haven't seen my arms like waving all over the place currently, um, typically my classroom doesn't even have chairs. So I'm like up and running around the room <laughs> the whole time. Um, but it definitely makes an impression with students. Um, a lot of times they know the answer, but they're having trouble accessing the language to tell you. So using a gestural clue, such as spinning a finger for a loop can help jumpstart and provide the visual aid they need. You can also prompt with phonemic cues, the, the beginning sound of the word, um, or with the more specific pointed questions to help them access their knowledge. Written expression can be more difficult to accommodate in a computer science setting, though the most important and fundamental accommodation is probably already in place, that being the use of a computer, right? Not having to rely on handwriting. Using a computer along with dictation software, um, such as Voice Note 2 or something like that, um, students can work on these difficulties more easily than ever. For writing code, I often follow a process with my students that I call a task card. With these, I first do a problem with them, introducing something new along the way, um, writing a piece of code with them up on the screen. Then I'll give them a task with an example we just did and the similar problem for them to do either in partners or independently. This way they have a template to work from and can focus on the concept instead of the syntax. Something else that's been integral to my classroom is JetBrains WebStorm. Um, the JetBrains family of IDEs has been so helpful. Um, it has a really beautiful integrated spell check um, and it will even do things like spell check user created variables. So it'll ask, did you mean to say so-and-so? Like I had one student who spelled the word answer wrong as a user created variable throughout his entire program, but it was spelled the same way each time. And that is all that mattered. Um, so being able to have a program that can help with that is so important because nothing is more frustrating than the student having the sound logic, the program looks right, and it's not working because they spelled something wrong. Um, it also, this IDE also will auto-complete terms and include a drop-down list of terms, which is really helpful as well. Some other ways to help with written expression include modeling your own thought process when working through a new problem. Um, students have to be taught methods of computational thinking, and it's not always an area they've spent a lot of time developing, especially when their academic attention might have been focused in areas where they had more fundamental struggles, right? So if so much of their academic history has been spent working on just learning how to read, this is an area that might need more specific attention to grow. <sighs> okay, executive functioning. Um, accommodations for this um, are so key because I think this is so prolific among students. It's probably the most common difficulty you'll see. And as we've already talked about, it's the ability to organize time, information, and material. I know, <laughs> I know I love to procrastinate, but I have a system for myself that works after many years of honing it, right? Um, I was never explicitly taught how to budget my time, and it's something I had to figure out on my own. But a lot of our students really need and would benefit from a discussion on the organization of time. 
We spend a lot of time in my class discussing how to organize their time in projects. And there are several steps to teach it. So I would first give students a small class project, which like this year we started out in Scratch, creating games in Scratch. And we mapped out our time for that project over the course. It was about a two week project. Um, and then next we moved on to creating games using processing. Um, we actually use P5JS, which is a port of processing. And for that, they had to map out then a month long project. So everything grew and built on, it, on each other and the length of time got longer. And as time got longer, we plotted out their time on calendars. So I went around and handed everybody a calendar and said, okay, show me, you know, what personal commitments you have. You know, are you going to be away this weekend, right? Are you going, <laughs> not that they have a lot going on this year necessarily, but <laughs> in typical years, plotting out, you know, what are you doing? When are you busy? Do you have a job? Are you working like all weekend, right? And then being able to say, okay, you know, I could probably get this piece done by Friday. I could finish that by Monday and plotting it out. Um, and that's not to say that they have to live and die by that calendar, but now they have a better idea of like, these are the tasks I need to complete. And this is about how long I think it's gonna take. And when they first start this, they might be totally off, but that's okay, right? This is the first step to learning it. So, um, next up, having computer science be such a project-based learning environment, I think is a really helpful way to help students with executive functioning difficulties learn those skills. Um, I think that it can be really overwhelming for them, but being able to help them break down their work, um, in these project-based learning environments and in a safe space can be really helpful to their growth in there. Other ways to work on executive functioning include limiting physical materials. Um, thankfully, <laughs> there aren't a ton of physical materials right now. Um, and I don't know that I'll go back to having a lot of physical materials. I do um, allow my students texts and things like that as resources. And I've definitely had a few students who preferred to use text as a resource. Um, but for the most part, everything is online, which has been really helpful. Um, however, we do continue working on naming documents, file systems, um, especially if you're doing things like web development, being able to trace a path is really important um, and organizing your files, right? So that's something to continue working on. Um, organizing information is a little bit trickier. It's mainly tackled by providing them with what they need in clearly labeled task cards, um, small text selections, and YouTube tutorials. So I use Canvas a lot in my classes um, as an online learning platform. And I have folders and sections for each unit um, in order that we learned it. So they can access what they want and need at any time there. Um, and so that is a piece that definitely grows with time. Okay, accommodations for working memory and auditory processing. Um, working memory and auditory processing are probably the most straightforward deficits, but are the most involved for us. Um, quick, easy accommodations can include writing down directions. Um, I like to post what we're doing in the chat for our online classes or write it on the board um, if we're in person so that they can access what we're doing at all times. Um, I also like to float around the room and kind of keep an eye, keep tabs on everybody and make sure that everybody's on the same page. I also very rarely lecture in my classes um, to the point that when I told my students I was giving an hour and a half long talk today, they were like, can you, can you even talk for that long? <laughs> yeah.
yes, I'll have you know, <laughs> I can. Um, I will also provide scaffolded notes if needed. Um, so if we're doing something that I think is going to be um, heavier lecture style, I'll provide written notes with pieces they just have to fill in. Um, I also, I just generally feel like it's a less effective way of teaching. I would rather they were doing and learning more by trial and error with me as a backup, um, especially when computer science is an area that lends itself so well to experiential learning, right? Nothing, nothing like getting your hands dirty and writing a program or using some electronics. Um, another method for combination is to slow down your speech, which I have been trying very hard to do, but it's definitely not my strength. Um, and slowing down the presentation of information. So prior to working in a special ed setting, it never occurred to me how much that that mattered. Um, a student will almost never raise their hand and say, you know, slow down, you're going too fast. <laughs> that will almost never happen. So it's up to you to really keep yourself in check on that. Okay, so um, this is where we come back to universal design for learning. Every accommodation I've discussed could benefit every learner in your classroom. The few accommodations listed here benefit students with learning disabilities, all students with learning disabilities, um, which is why they're not listed separately. But it's key for students with learning disabilities to have structure and routine in the classroom. And this is not to say that you can never deviate and you have to do the same thing every day. But you know, every day I provide an open activity, some independent work time, um, and then like a wrap up. I would say we do a task card two to three times a week. And the other couple of days we update websites and journals. Um, we also do presentations every week as a check-in where we can bounce ideas off each other and talk with each other about what we're working on. Um, and there are days that I throw all of it at the window and we spend the whole time talking about project planning um, or days where we work on projects for the whole class. Um, but the kids really do thrive on routine um, and really like to know how we're gonna start and how we're gonna end every day. Um, another important way to work on it work on universal design for learning is to have group work and partner work. I think those are so such important aspects for the hidden curriculum. And by the hidden curriculum, I mean social emotional learning. Um, something we as teachers know is so key to success, um, really in any environment, but especially so in an academic one. Um, and there are students who really struggle to engage in that. And by putting them into groups and partner projects, this is a way that they can really learn those skills. Um, it could definitely be messy and hard, especially as projects are more open-ended. However, you can help by providing scripted language with students to help them work on these tasks. Um, I have often pulled a student and said, hey, like, what, what are you guys working on? What's going on? And kind of role played out a conversation to try and help them talk through what they're working on together and work through their differences. Um, a lot of times it's just a communication issue and nothing really more than that. And they just need the language, which thankfully we're there to help provide. So I wanted to take a few minutes and see if anybody had any questions before I move on to the next section. Uh, questions, you could raise your hand in the um as a participant, or you can type it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask. I do have a question myself, though, uh, Sarah. Um, yes. So on, on one of the slides, I can't remember which one, you, 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 you talk about self-advocacy. Could you explain what you mean by that and, and, and how you would incorporate that into your class? Yes, I am planning on talking about that a little bit more later. Okay, I'll, um, I can wait, I can wait. 
You want to hold on to it for now? Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Uh, do your students take more than one CS class? Are the classes you offer for a full year? Yes. So our classes at my school, I see my students for 50 minutes a day, every day, um, all year long. And I have up to three years of curriculum. Um, because it is such a small school, what I teach class to class and year to year varies based on who I have. So I might have in the same room, I might have a kid who I've had in their, in their first year, their second year, in their third year. Um, all in the same room. Um, I have I have that in probably both my classes right now, actually. Sounds like the schoolhouse um, on the prairie. <laughs> it is, it really is. Um, yeah. I also have, I'll have all four grades in the same room as well, though oftentimes it's primarily juniors and seniors. Um, I've had the, the full ninth and 12th in the same room. And uh, Nate, Nate has a question, do you wanna Unmute yourself, Nate. Yeah, Hi, Farah. Farah. Hi, Farah. Oh, are there two of us speaking? Sorry. Uh, I called on Nate because he had his hand up. Oh, I'm driving, so I'm I'm listening while I'm driving. Okay, yeah, just mute yourself for a moment, and we'll get back to you, darling. Go ahead, Nate. Oh, uh, yeah. My question was about the accommodation versus modification. Um, you know, uh, as you said, you kind of got your own program running. Um, but I'm wondering how that's like, what percentage you would say, um, which is more accommodation or modification and, and maybe since you've been doing it for so long, how, how that's changed over time or not perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that I have eased up on my students in, um, explicit teaching in several ways. Um, but I do still stick to a pretty strict routine and structure for my students. Um, accommodation, yeah, is more making the material accessible to them. And I have found that my students can do really well with high level material. Um, uh, regardless of their experience with computer science, they, they come to me with the abstract thinking skills and the creative problem solving that's so key to computer science in so many ways. Um, so being able to just accommodate the material and the reading level and uh, provide them the structure and the scaffolding they need has been really successful. Um, I think one of the biggest ways my teaching has kind of evolved over the seven years of teaching computer science is that I opened it up a lot more um, to let them kind of create their own projects. Um, the first half of the year, is often very structured. All I get to know everybody, we get our feet under us. We're all doing kind of the same projects in sequence. Um, and then the last third of the year, I'll say, is more so independent projects and letting them really kind of dive in and take the skills they've learned, the project planning skills, um, executive functioning skills, computer science skills and put that all together and make their own projects and kind of help get their feet under them confidence wise, right? Like you can do this and you know the skills, you have the skills you need to do it. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Darling, you wanna unmute and ask your question? Hi, yes, hi, Sarah. Um, Hello. I Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I also teach um, computer science to students with disabilities and with autism. And um, you said that you teach in a three to one setting. So our ratio at our school overall is three to one. So I'm teaching an elective course. So my courses are often maxed out at eight. Um, okay. But I also teach two one on one classes that are reading remediation. Um, okay. So if you so look at our question, school's overall ratio, yeah. Are, are they alternate assessment or, or are you guys just fortunate enough to be able to give uh, students that, uh, you know, take a statewide um, exam one-on-one -on -one or three-to-one um, attention that way? 
Um, when we give students exams, a lot of them have accommodations for mm -hmm. small group testing. Um, a lot of them have accommodations for readers as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have some students with scribes, but I haven't encountered that in my classes specifically, but it, okay. there are students with that profile in my school. Mm -hmm. um, so we do really run the gamut of accommodations, even in a standardized setting. Okay, I was fascinated by that three to one. I'm like, my lowest has been six to one, and they're all alternate, alternate assessment. Mm -hmm. I never even heard of three to one, but thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Darlene. Um, well, we're getting a lot of questions now. I'm gonna ask Sarah. Some of these questions we can answer later. Do uh, you wanna, uh, one, two, or four or five of them now, do you wanna go on and then we'll get back to make sure that you get to answer these questions later? Yes, sure. Okay, so I'll continue, but we'll make sure to go back to any questions that are left in the chat at the end yeah. that are not addressed. Okay, so those computers. There we go. Okay, so using these accommodations in a computer science classroom, I have talked about some of the ways that I accommodate already. Um, the main pieces that I use, um, as I said, are the WebStorm IDEs. I found those to be invaluable. Um, though this year I've also used Repolit with my students, um, which has been really helpful um, given that we, my classes are hybrid. Um, so I have some students in person and some online in every class. Um, it's still a small ratio, but I'm still split between um, in person and online every day. So Repolit has been really great for that because it acts like kind of Google Drive, like you can, or like a Google Doc where you can see the other student writing in the program. Um, so students have been able to work together still, even while socially distanced. Uh, Sarah, um, before you go on, I just want to go through this list. I want to make sure that everybody knows that these slides will be available uh, afterwards. And um, we all have your email and, and you'll have a, a link to them. Um, okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, YouTube, as I talked about, is also invaluable. I don't know who doesn't love YouTube, especially for learning a new skill. Um, I want to give a specific shout out to the YouTube tutorials for processing. Um, a man named Daniel Schiffman has an incredible set of YouTube tutorials. Um, I think we spent like a whole class one day just talking about how great he was and his, his YouTube tutorials on processing. Um, he also covers P5JS and all the different ports of processing. Um, so definitely feel free to check those out. That's been, my students love it and it's always been really fun. Um, Quorum, which is a completely accessible programming language that's completely screen reader accessible as well. Um, I've had some students use that and really enjoy it. And it's super easy to get started and get right into making like your very own dungeon crawler complete with graphics. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, block based languages. I almost always start my students off with scratch. Um, even though they're high schoolers, we do like a quick two week unit on it. And I have never had a complaint. They find it super fun. They can do really neat stuff and they can learn those programming concepts without having to go through and focus on language, right? They don't have to focus on spelling. They very rarely will have to focus on decoding, which has been really helpful. Um, MIT App Inventor is another block-based language that's really fun. You can, I think they use it on iPhone now too. Um, like mobile CSP uses it. Um, if you're teaching computer science principles, um, they use App Inventor and you could make your own apps. And what do kids love more than their cell phones? Literally, probably nothing. So that's always a really fun one to try out. Um, the Head First by O'Reilly Books, which I already talked about a little bit, but I love them. I personally have done several of them on my own and I find them to be just really useful and accessible language-wise, but without being condescending, which I think is really important because a lot of times 
um, at least a lot of my students, have kind of been burned by reading level in text, um, right? Being given adapted books and things like that, which can be kind of a hit to your self-confidence, right? Um, so I think it's really great that this resource exists. Um, Project-based learning. I cannot <laughs> speak highly enough about letting kids like run free with a project, right? They love it. Um, group work especially can be really fun. It can be hard for some kids, but with the appropriate scaffolding, right? Providing them the language to use, it can totally be worth it. Hardware such as Arduino and Raspberry Pi also can be really fun for our students. Um, I almost always do a unit on Arduino and my kids love it. Um, being able to see what you programmed, make a light turn on, <laughs> like what could be better, right? Turning an RGB through the whole rainbow, <laughs> amazing. They love it. And I've had kids do wild projects. I'll show you a few as we um, move on. Okay. So a growth mindset, I think is super important to have in a computer science classroom, um, but realistically just in education at all. I've had countless students who have had teachers tell them that they're stupid, literally have called them stupid. Um, it seems so outlandish and unreal to me, um, but I've also had a fairly blessed academic career. I, I cannot imagine there were kids who would say that to, to students who would say that to a kid, um, but it's, it's real and it's out there. So we don't wanna marginalize their experience. And I think it's important to hold that truth, but also to show these kids that that is not true, right? They, are not stupid and they can do this. And it's up to us to teach them that, right? Learned helplessness can be kind of a byproduct of that, right? Like, I can't do it, why should I try? Um, so being able to show kids that they can access this, even such a rigorous field as computer science um, is so important. And I think this is where your story becomes important. Um, I personally came to computer science at probably the age of 23 or 24. Um, I took one computer science course in college called Artbotics, um, which was making art installations using crickets, which were essentially Arduinos. Um, and I'm self-taught. Um, I learned by doing some online edX courses and by reading head first books. And um, from there, I now I'm teaching it to high school kids, right? And so as a result, I don't know everything. And my students know that. <laughs> they know it well. But I'm willing to find out. And I'm willing to do it with them and alongside them. So it gets important to share when you make a mistake and share the ways that you can get better and the ways they can get better. Um, it's important for them to see you struggle sometimes and to see that it's OK to struggle and that that's how you grow. Um, so a typical class, um, I've talked a little bit about this. So just briefly, we focus on routine, time, structure, structured templates, modeling, doing um, oral rehearsal, right? And including students in the learning process. Your students are the expert in their learning disability. They know what works for them. And if they are struggling to find what works for them, it's up to you to find more options, right? What can you present them that can help? Maybe they have not figured out audiobooks are the key, right? Maybe that's something that would really help. So trying to present to them different options. Um, on the right, this is um, one of my students, Alaska, who actually made a jacket that used an accelerometer and an Arduino Pro Mini, I believe it was. Um, so that the jacket would light up when you were running at night, so it would be safer for running. Um, so that's just one of the, the projects that they were able to come up with on their own. Universal design for learning. Um, again, I talked a little bit about this, but 
I think it's important to think work smarter, not harder, right? If you are implementing, implementing these accommodations across the board for your students, it's even less work for you, right? Than trying to find just the right accommodation. Do it across the board. Access for everybody is better for everybody. So um, when you're thinking about universal design strategies, um, you can have specific written instructions. You can have clear rubrics, right? My students love rubrics with clear expectations. They're very explicit. Um, I'll post them on Canvas at the start of each project and say, you know, this is what you need to have. These are the pieces. Where do you fall on this scale, right? What can you improve? There are no questions about what I am asking them to do. Um, I often scaffold tasks. You know, here is a worksheet and I'm missing, you know, half of the text and you need to fill it out or, you know, you're struggling with that, let me find you a resource that can help. Um, structured exercises like the task cards I do, right? Where we do kind of a, I do, we do, you do process, right? Working top down. Individualized project based instruction. Um, this is a place where students can really shine and they can create kind of their own work in what they're doing. Um, and making failure okay is so key. <laughs> Literally, I mess up all the time. I make mistakes all the time. And my students love to make fun of me for it. I actually have one of my students who's working on web design right now, and he just made a website and it's just a whole website roasting me. And it is so great. <laughs> Because this kid came in and was like, you know, I just needed an elective and I didn't know what to take. <laughs> but now he's made his whole own website from scratch. And it might be a website roasting me, but that's okay. It creates a really safe environment for my class where my students know that like, you know, we can mess up in here and then we can take it and we can move on. Um, using multiple modalities is so incredibly important, right? Being able to provide students physical materials to use or auditory or visual, whatever works best for them. Um, and again, the students, the expert on themselves. Okay, so I've talked about the safe classroom environment being so important. Um, and I do think it is a key piece of the puzzle because if students don't feel like they can fail in your classroom, they're not going to get very far. Um, I rely pretty heavily on hardware in my intro classes a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, the odds are good that whatever they, they make for their first project, it's not going to come out right. It's not going to be exactly how they want it to be. And that's okay, right? It's their first project. It's their first kind of independent foray into this. And that is fine. Um, the more we pick up as we go, the better we can be doing next time. Um, so I work hard in my classroom to be a model of patience and positivity, <laughs> though that's not always the easiest thing. Um, even though, you know, my students are a delight all the time. It helps also that we have resources for them to kind of explore their own interests and work their way through projects at their own pace. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry, I zipped ahead a bit. Okay. Um, another piece that I think is really important is allowing students to take ownership of the learning process. Um, I have one of the issues um, that I struggle with in my classroom is the student who wants to ask me a question all the time, right? Miss Iris, um, what about this? And I, <laughs> I like to do reflective questioning back, but I don't know, what do you think about that, right? And then giving them a little bit of wait time um, and, 
you know, I would bet that four out of five times they can figure it out on their own in just a couple of minutes and they don't really need me. Right. But they kind of need a sounding board to bounce it off of. So I think that that's really important being able to know when to help and when not to help, right? When to step in. Do they really need me right now? Maybe not. Um, Self-advocacy. Um, as Richard brought up earlier, I think this is super key. We wanna set our kids up for success in the future. I'm not their only teacher. I might only be their teacher this year. I might be sending them off to college next year, right? Um, or into a trade or something like that. So I think that being able to teach them to advocate for themselves is so important. They need to be able to access the entire piece of the hidden curriculum, the entire hidden curriculum, right? The rules we teach our students about morality, kindness, social interaction, etiquette, um, those are all pieces that we need to kind of impart more explicitly. And advocating for themselves can be tough for kids in the special education system, especially if they have struggled and have had less than stellar academic histories. Um, a lot of them have been bruised or worse by their schools in the past. And to show weakness within this realm can seem like opening themselves up just for further scrutiny. So it's up to us to show them that this is actually a strength. I just today had, we had a senior event on campus and I was sitting around with, I think probably six seniors, four of whom I had in class either this year or in the past. And they're talking about their plans for next year, right? They've got either their, their trade schools or careers, colleges on lock. And so they're talking through and they were talking about what they do for work right now or what they're planning. And they were talking about how they oftentimes don't want to disclose their, their learning disabilities to their workplace because then they get treated as less than. And this is prolific and also part of a bigger conversation and a bigger shift that needs to happen. Um, but I think it's still important for them to know that talking about what you need and getting what you need to succeed is not a weakness. It's something that can help push them further, especially in a college setting. Um, if you don't ask for accommodations in college, you just don't get them. If you don't identify your needs, you don't get that help. And that can make a big difference. So self teaching self-advocacy skills can be approached in several different ways um, and a few different strategies. I tell my kids to use your resources, meaning ask your classmates, look online, look around the classroom. You're, you're welcome to ask me, but I might just reflective question back at you. <laughs> um, and you need to try on your own first. Um, I'm more than glad to help them, but a lot of times, as I said, they can do it. Uh, you can also provide them with question stems or search terms. Uh, that can be tough for students. Um, I also will project up some stems or strategies on the board that aren't targeted to anyone in particular, but you know, are you having trouble? Here are some different things you can try, right? Until they can internalize that. Um, I also try to ask them, I try to encourage them to ask for more time, right? If they want an extension on a project, ask, but do it appropriately, right? You can't just say, I'm not gonna be done in time, help, right? You need to know ahead of time and you need to advocate for yourself appropriately ahead of time, right? I want an email in writing. Can you give me an extension? Um, so those kinds of things are really helpful and will hopefully push students to being their own best advocate. Sarah, this is Richard again. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, could you go through these three case studies that you yep. had planned? And then maybe we can go to questions. So there's some left over, okay? Yep, sounds great. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a few students. Um, this is one of my students, Zizi. Um, she 
came to my class because she knew that STEM fields were lacking in women and thought she that thought that she could help remedy that by taking my class. Um, she did end up taking some computer science courses in college um, and it's one of her minors. So that was really exciting. But she had a fair amount of difficulty recovering from small failures. And it was evident in the work she did um, for me and the frequency with which she asked me for help for things that she had the tools to handle independently that this was tough for her. So my first step was, first step to helping her was making sure that she was aware of her resources and reminding her how she could access them. Um, but a switch flipped when she found out that she could kind of tailor this to her interests. So she very quickly decided, oh, I'm gonna make a portfolio website for myself. And she went above and beyond in this um, and did such a great job making it. She has a, a big interest in art and design. So when I brought up the Arduino lily pads to her, which is a sewable circuit for Arduino, she immediately had a million bright ideas of what she could do. Um, and she decided to go with this umbrella. So this is um, just a Van Gogh umbrella that she sewed twinkle lights into all the stars and then programmed it to shine in different intervals. Um, and she did such a great job. And the first time this umbrella lit up, I think you could probably hear her across campus because she was so excited. Um, and she did it on her own, right? She did this all independently. Um, this is Dewey. Um, he ended up going to college for business um, and took some computer science classes in college, more in kind of a data science kind of way. Um, he's he was a student of mine for several years, and he was actually um, the inspiration for the computer science classes. He approached me when he was a freshman and asked if we had computer science, and at the time we didn't. Um, <laughs> so we ended up working on this incredible arcade cabinet, um, but he struggled really with follow through on projects. He was the kind of kid who'd pick up a project, start it and lose interest and move on, um, hit a wall and think, you know, okay, I, that's enough. <laughs> I'm ready to move on. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're not, he often didn't want to get into tinkering. Um, he was not, he wouldn't give himself the free reign to mess up a project. Right. Um, so being able to give him that time to tinker on something really helped. Um, he also had difficulty um, with executive functioning skills and digital planning to break the project down. So sitting down with him and helping work through um, a schedule and a calendar helped to finish this up. He also worked with a partner and that helped keep him on track as well. Um, so he worked with another student in a different class of mine named Joey, and they actually met together a few times out of class to finish up. And they made this full Raspberry Pi arcade cabinet. The whole thing functioned. It was completely full size. Um, they even built the cabinet itself <laughs> with some help from my husband. Thanks, husband. Um, and it was just so great, right? He was able to push past that failure, collaborate with another student, and get it done. And then we had a super fun arcade cabinet in our classroom that whole year. Okay, last student I'm gonna talk about, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark is a fairly new student to me. I had him for the first time last year, um, but he's also the kind of kid who would spend his whole weekend making a project. Um, he does independent engineering projects for fun all the time. He created a button at his house that you hit the button and it turns on your TV, turns on Netflix and starts the first episode of The Office. Um, he also created a dog alarm for his bedroom so that if his dog went into his bedroom, it would start beeping wildly so he could run over and get the dog. <laughs> um, and he spent almost all of last year working on an automatic plant watering system that used Arduino and weather data. Um, the project really stretched him in this regard. He'd not previously utilized outside data in his work. Um, and for this, he had to take data himself 
um, from different plants and soil um, and evaporation to determine soil readings and what they meant and how you should program the system to water the plants. Um, this was especially exciting to me because I had him um, after the first lockdown began and he ended up completing this project at home on his own. Um, I got like a full, these are actually screen caps from like a three minute video he sent me of like how the project works and um, it was really great. So he had a great job with that and he is able to move past um, the initial failures of this project. Um, and even though it took him, I would say this project took him six months at least to complete, he saw it all the way through to fruition. Um, so just getting to see that is, you know, just amazing. Okay, so where can you begin, right? Identify student needs outline some accommodations that you think could be useful and then implement as necessary. If you look at it from a universal design perspective, then you will probably be more successful as well. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, there are a few extra slides that will that follow this, but we'll just skip those for now and go right to questions. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the chat and go through the questions in the chat. And if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and I'll get to you shortly. So earlier you talked about these task cards. Could you give an example of what you meant by that, the task card? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times in real life, <laughs> they would just be uh, pieces of paper, a lot of times like that I would even cut up so they're small, right? Like I'm giving the student a bite-sized piece of information in a small task. Um, and it was it's often the way that I teach um, syntax in particular. So I will provide them with an example of a loop, right? And I'll say, you know, I want you to be able to print out um, the num all the numbers from eight to 42 um, by threes or something like that. And I'll give them a syntax for it. And then I will set them free to try it on their own um, while I'm then going around and helping as needed. Um, so it's a piece, it sounds like a piece of scaffolding. Essentially, yes. Um, so it has like the scaffold they need of the syntax along with a quick task in like a bite-sized piece. Yeah. Um, and then any additional scaffolding a lot of times it's generally like more like oral rehearsal and conversation surrounding the task. Um, online, it looks more like a Google Doc. So another question that came up, do you, do you have anecdotal evidence that doing computer science classes and projects improves student skills to uh, problem solve and function? I've definitely seen improvement in my students over the course of a year. Um, so my students, because many are funded by their public schools too, we also um, take data through, um, take data for their IEPs as well. Um, so we have more standard benchmarks for it. Um, but I will say that I see a lot of growth in my students from working their way through longer and longer projects. Um, there are definitely different ways in which kids struggle, right? Um, so it's a lot of, you know, figuring out what does this kid need, right? What, what's, what's the barrier here that we can help push them through? Um, yeah, I think that's okay, a piece so of it. I'm trying to think of like a more specific anecdote. I'll yeah. have to think on it for a minute. Anyway, there's another question here. My class has 20 to 30 students ranging from sixth to eighth grade. The ability ranges of the students who read at a second grade level to the gifted level. So I teach HTML and, and JavaScript. I really struggle with my students who can't read. I feel like I've tried a lot of things that you've talked about, but it just seems so difficult. 
Do you have any other suggestions? So this would be somebody that is not really read, I guess, or read at second grade level. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you encounter that in your experience. Yeah, I would probably focus more on block-based languages, um, but I would also recommend speech to text, um, allowing students to do um, speech to text into an IDE might be helpful. Um, a lot of times I've found that my students, um, I've definitely had students with reading levels that felt close to that range at least. Um, and being able to um, voice what they're working on has been really helpful for them um, as well. <laughs> Thank you, I just saw the chat. Um, being able to work with a partner also could be really helpful, right? So pairing up students who, you know, maybe one student's a stronger reader than the other, um, pairing them up together to work on something could be useful. Um, I, I'm gonna assume you're, you have to do HTML and CSS, but um, so if that's the case, then I would definitely look into using IDEs that have more accommodation features like WebStorm. Um, JetBrains WebStorm specifically is, is HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, and my students have found a lot of success with that. Um, the, if, if you can open it up a little bit more, um, MIT App Inventor has a nice bridge where you can um, do it in block-based language, but you can also port it to a text-based language. So you can see both side by side, which I think has been um, a nice feature as like a bridge from scratch to a more advanced block-based language, but also takes off some of the pressure of having to write out all your text as you're writing, um, as you're coding. So I hope that's a little bit have helpful. You, have you used the code.org curriculum or for example, computer science principles in your class? Have I? Yeah. Yes, um, I have. I have used sections of it, but not all of it. Um, and I've also used mobile CSP in my class as well. I see. Yeah. Um, hold on. And somebody comments. Thank you. That's the curriculum. Okay, that I use. I, so I have a, a kind of a technical question about computer science principles since you've done that. And it seems to come up a lot is that in computer science principles, there's a performance called a performance task. It's part of the exam, you know, part of the AP exam. And the students are supposed to do that completely on their own. And there's a lot, a lot of direction in the in the from the college board about how to how do you incorporate the accommodations that the student has on their say their IEP uh, with the performance task. And it's, and they put a lot of things in the college parts that don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And some of the things that you'd want to do as part of their accommodation might be on the list of don'ts. So what have you encountered that problem and how have you coped with that? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, I've not specifically encountered this issue, um, but I personally, if it's in their IEP, I would, I likely would do it anyway. <laughs> which is maybe not the right answer. Um, but the IEP is a legal document. And if they are entitled to those accommodations, then they should receive those accommodations. There's a reason it's there. Um, I am not a fan of anything that's gonna hold students back, um, particularly when we know they're so capable of it, right? My kids are, my, so I have students who are leagues ahead of me. <laughs> in computer science it's incredible right i love it um so i would probably still accommodate as needed um, i think another way around that might be to provide them with a create task of your own creation that is very similar so that you can then work with them through accommodating for the task right sit down with them and go through in detail and annotate and talk about what is expected of them in the task you've given. Um, I would probably also create like a rubric surrounding it. Like these are the pieces I'm looking for within that, right? How can you break this task down on your own? And how could you then kind of attack the problem 
Yeah, and I think they have certain things you're supposed to be in the in the uh, performance task in the program, like the use of uh, functions, for example. So, mm -hmm. and that had that's kind of a you know when they use that notion in the College Board, it, it's very very general. It's not the technical mm -hmm. name of a function in a particular programming language, but it's a very general idea. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, apply that. Fun idea. Yeah, functions are definitely a skill um, that I teach explicitly, right? Like I will, within within the year, I'll go through explicitly and teach, you know, while loops, for loops, functions, variables, global variables, etc. Um, control flow, right? And we have projects that encompass all those pieces so that hopefully when they get to that point, they can use it independently and have the resources to fall back on to find out how to do it on their own without me. So uh, this, nobody's raising their hand, but maybe my, they like my questions. I don't know. And there's nothing <laughs> new in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna pretend that I'm a teacher. I have 30 students at the, at the high school level and I have two students, just two in my class who have a learning disability of some kind. Maybe, you know, it's a, it's a, a big spectrum of, of things it could be, but they're different. You know, not the same disability, exactly the same. So can you give some advice to me as a teacher of that has only two students with IEPs? How would I handle that? Um, I think the key point is to think about how these ways you're accommodating for those students can be useful to everybody, right? I don't, I don't know a single student who is going to not benefit from having a sentence stem or a single student who is not going to benefit from having scaffolded notes or a single student who's not going to benefit from, you know, being able to choose the modality they learn in, right? Do I care if my students get their information from uh, a vetted YouTube source versus if they get it from a textbook versus if they get it from um, a website. I, I really don't, right? I want them to be able to use what works best for them. Um, I know that there are specific curriculum that we need to use at times, but there are still, I'm sure, so many different modalities you can use within that um, that are really great resources that are out there. And it's a matter of I think letting kids kind of be the expert on themselves, um, providing them with options and letting them make those choices. I think there is an advantage to the project-based learning that, you know, that not, not all projects are done in the same amount of time. And you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's a little more loose. It's not like everybody does the same thing and they're struggling to do those same, same things. They mm -hmm. have their project and they get to do their project their way. So that yeah. might be the, big advantage to the project-based learning. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, I, for sure. Yeah, so I wonder if anybody has a question. If you wanna just unmute and ask. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Really yeah, excited. thank you all for coming tonight. And I, oh, there's something showed up. We like your questions, Richard. <laughs> See, you've got this all now, uh, Richard. I should've kept my mouth shut. Um, <laughs> And I know that person who said that, and she knows me. So um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a wonderful presentation. And I learned a lot myself. You know, it's like, gosh, every time I talk to you, I learn something new. So thank you so much. And maybe we can stop right. the recording now, Brianna. Great. Thanks, everyone.